All right, everybody, welcome to the first Sherman Show of 2021. I'm here today, Jeff Sherman, with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And we are giving you a market 2020 recap, an outlook, and who, other, who else will we bring on but our own colleague, Jeff Mayberry. Welcome back to the show, Jeff. Thank you. It's been a few months. Good to be here. Yeah, um, we've, uh, we've made it through 2020. Um, feels like 2021 doesn't look much different so far. So uh, maybe uh, before we get into that and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the strange effect of just uh, when the calendar flips over, everybody thinks the world changes. Maybe before we talk about pre- potentially some of those changes, we start with Mr. Lau's uh, recap of what happened in 2020. Yeah, so the market recap for 2020 was uh, somewhat surprising, I think, to anybody that uh, realizes or looks back and sees the current situation that we're in now, as well as what really began in, I suppose, in February. But starting with the S&P 500 in 2020, uh, you had a positive return of 18.5% on the Barclays U.S. aggregate, positive return of 7.5%. Gold was up about 30, sorry, 20%, 21% on a tradable basis. Uh, LME copper up 25%. And WTI crude oil, um, the lone loser within that cohort, down 60%. But got to say, year to date, it's off to a strong start with up, you know, right about 10%. Well, it's also um, quite strange. Uh, we recall uh, last uh, spring, we actually saw a negative oil price. So I guess minus 60 is a huge recovery from those negative oil prices we saw uh, back in the spring. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, a lot of strange things happened uh, over the course of 2020, and as we reset the calendar, as you say, you know, with that, uh, with the 1231 going into January 4th, first business day, we'll see what 21, uh, 2021 holds yep. for us. But uh, finishing up the the recap here on uh, the the uh, sovereign um, sovereign front on 10-year Treasuries, we close the year at 92 basis points. We are up. Um, as of yesterday, you know, we've ticked down a little bit today, but as of yesterday, as of Tuesday, it's close. Uh, the 10 year treasury was at one spot, uh, 13, 1.1%, uh, let's call it. So up about uh, 20 bips on the, the short uh, start to the year. Uh, the 10 year boom. What's interesting about that, <clears throat> Sam, is that um, if you think about all the volatility we saw last year, the 10 year only really rallied about 100 basis points. And so Um, For all the support of the Fed, the programs, I'm sure we'll have Mr. Mayberry talk about that. But when you think about it and you really look at it, um, it, the the bulk of the move that happened in treasuries really transpired within the first 10 or 11 weeks of the year. And I like to remind people that since the middle of March, rates had been somewhat unidirectionally in an upward fashion. And, you know, as you look on the technicals and things, what we see here is that that 98 basis points or so was a, was a tough uh, part to breach. And since then, since we went through that, um, you started to see some kind of upward channels and stuff in, in, in the rates markets. So um, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it, it is quite interesting. People say, oh, well, rates rallied last year, market did really well. Well, that was very, very front loaded in, in the bulk of the first quarter. And since then, uh, rates and duration really haven't been your friend as a, as a fixed income investor. That's right. Yeah, and it's interesting, like we were always, you know, when we were having our meetings, it was always a, we're in this 50 to 65 basis point range. And then the range ticked up to 60 to 75 and 75 to 90. And here we are having broken 100, uh, 100 you know, 113 basis points. And we're now, we're, are we in this 100 to 120 range? When we break through 120, are we going to, is the range going to move up? So. Definitely, as you said, uh, Chairman, the, the ranges have, or the, the trend has been up, and I think the ranges continue to just move up in, in the kind of a more orderly fashion. Yeah, and speaking about orderly, I mean, if we move to Old Faithful here and look at the, the 10 year JGBs, they're right there, you know, guess what, right around uh, zero again. So yeah. perhaps that's something we can discuss later there in the stability of the JGBs. Are we going to see it here in the US as you know, the, the chatter around yield curve control? Well, I think it's interesting, too, that JGBs actually went up last year. So when you look at the calendar basis, they went from minus two basis points and the end of the year at two basis points. Right. So um, a really tough year in uh, in the JGB (laughs) market, you had negative carry, plus you had price depreciation from that, giving you a a slightly negative return for the year. And uh, 
you know, you talked about the tenure off to the races, the JGB as well, as of yesterday, it was up to three basis points. So a huge uh, one basis point move. So uh, we've seen 25% of the move in 12, 2020 in the first couple of weeks of uh, 2021 so far. Yeah. And it's the other way around, bro. When we look at, you know, the credit markets and the spread there, I mean, if we take a look at the spreads uh, from, let's just use the IG corporate credit market, they're actually a little bit tighter, you know, from the end of 2019 and into the end of 2020. And the same with the high yield market as well. You know, so what I find is amazing when you think about what transpired, we had this huge rally in rates. And then you look at the, and you look at spreads on corporate bonds and, you know, who would have thought, you know, with all the crisis, the pandemic, the overhang that we have from there, still the structural challenges in the, in the labor market, you had a two basis point rally in IG last year. So um, you guys know I kind of abuse this phrase. I call it the Rip Van Winkle market, right? Where if you went to sleep at the beginning of the year, woke up at the end of the year, you just thought, hey, it's another killer uh, year in, in markets. Um, greatest economy ever, as we were talking about a couple of years ago, um, as someone famously called it. And when you look at the performance, you would have thought really not much had happened. And when you look across the board, it's pretty amazing to see how corporate bonds really performed in 2021. I'm sorry, in 2020. Yeah, I mean, it's been, what, a century since the last pandemic, so I wasn't around for that one. Um, but uh, it's pretty surprising how, you know, if you think pandemic, you don't think positive performance in financial markets. And that's pretty way, much the way it shook out, you know, just looking at the calendar year performance, of course, the, the wiggles and jiggles in between. But across the board with you know, a few exceptions, you had positive performance all across. All right, well, let, let's, let's move on to, because ultimately no one cares about what happened last year. Either, either you made your money or you didn't. People are tuning in today to hear Mr. Mayberry's views about 2021. So why don't we talk about that? Why don't you tee us up on what you're thinking about, Sam? And um, let's go through various markets and, and how we're uh, thinking about those today. Yeah, I guess I mean, a good starting point is our multi-asset um, growth team puts together an aggregation of the various sell side predictions for the, the uh, coming year. So as we reset that calendar, what we see here for, um, let's start out with GDP growth, uh, 2021 GDP growth on average across, I'd say about 12 uh, players in the sell side research firms are putting an average GDP, uh, average real GDP growth for the year of 2021 at 4.3% real GDP. Um, you wait, know, wait, looking so you, you said 4.3% growth in 2021. That's the average, right? Correct. Um, across and, that cohort. and so I, I was digging into this and looking at it and saying, okay, when is the last time we've seen a calendar year um, actually have a 4.3% real GDP growth? And the answer to that was back in 2000. And it's, oh, sorry, it ended in 99, 2000, but you could get a year over year comparison. One of the summers, I think it was, um, what was it? 2014, we, we briefly reached that 4% range. Uh, it was like 4.1 or something like that. But given this average growth rate that we've seen kind of since the crisis being kind of the low twos, I think, you know, I usually call it between two, two and two, three, somewhere in that, that ballpark. Um, what gives here, Mr. Mayberry, wh wh where is this 4.3% real GDP coming from? I mean, it has to just be coming from, from the bottom, from the rebound still, that we're still down. Um, you know, we had a, a very, obviously a very terrible second quarter, rebound in the third quarter of 2020. And so we're still kind of working our way out of that hole. And so I think that you know, Wall Street is expecting that we'll continue to work our way out of the hole as the vaccine comes through. There's a lot of you hear a lot of there's there's pent up demand. Um, and I think, as you said earlier, I don't know, you can go on vacation, but you're probably not going to eat uh, multiple steak dinners uh, this, you know, or two steaks to the same dinner. I guess there, there's that's not as much pent up demand, but a lot of vacations, a lot. Of, uh, and you, you started to see it a little bit in the TSA traveler data going through the holidays that just occurred. Um, so I guess you, you would expect that Wall Street would say, hey, that that pent up demand is going to explode in, into more upside in, in GDP. Yeah, I mean, I, I just try to kind of think about it, though, you know, I mean, look, I, I don't think the GDP contracts at this at this level, given that we have so much fiscal support out there in the marketplace. But, you know, a four handle is tough. And that, that's real GDP. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about inflation. But, you know, if you just use today's inflation print, right, um, you know, it's about one six is what came out today in headline CPI. If you had that four three, that's talking about a six percent nominal growth rate. 
and let's just rewind the clock what Sam was talking about. We have a 10 year trade in about 110 basis points. If we have a 6% nominal growth rate, um, what does that say about you know, the, the price or, or the value within the treasury market today? I mean, I would say that you, 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 don't, you definitely think rates should go, be going up. Doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem like a 110 10 year is, uh, is appropriately priced given that, you know, that outlook. Yeah. So, so Sam, when you looked at it, what was the average inflation rate that folks are talking about? I mean, inflation seems to be on the mind of many investors. We're hearing this from our clients. Um, we've been focused on it. You know, we, we think that, you know, inflation kit is going to print with uh, the two handles throughout many points throughout the year. And in some instances, maybe getting close to three on a year over year uh, level with base effects. What, what are people saying on the street about the average CPI rate today? Yeah, so what we're looking at there across the same cohort is an average inflation rate on headline CPI of 1.8%, which guess what, that's just the, uh, the average pretty much since the global financial crisis outside of the COVID period. Um, it's actually, if you look at 1.8%, it's a little bit lower than what we've been hitting coming into 2020. So it is, uh, it, it's so not for all this talk of really hearing about. Yeah, but all this talk of inflation you know, and it's one of those things where Wall Street is very quick to ratchet up GDP. They're quick to ratchet up earnings estimates or anything that's pro growth. But even for all the talk about inflation going up, it's shocking to me to hear that essentially most people are, are just kind of anchoring that to roughly a 2% number today. That's right. It is surprising. I mean, because you, you hear the talk you know, from, from all sides, you know, the, the buy side, sell side, you hear from corporations, you know, on on fears of inflation, um, you know, perhaps you have a little bit of that fool me once, fool me twice kind of uh, mentality in it where a lot of people who have been calling for inflation for, you know, let's call it since uh, the rebound in 2016 of, of certain, you know, commodity, uh, commodity uh, components as well as, uh, you know, the going into the synchronized global growth story, we, we've failed to see significant uh, inflation, you know, persist over periods of time. So I think they, there may be some of that in there hindering uh, the, the forecast. But um, like, but if you think about what the Fed announced at the Jackson Hole Symposium last year, and this idea of average inflation targeting, which the, the market somewhat took in stride a little bit, I think rates were up a little bit around that time, um, as you know, as part of that upward trend. But they're adopting this, uh, this philosophy of wanting to generate inflation on an average base of 2%. And given this underperformance, as you mentioned, of inflation for many, many years, um, you could argue many decades at this point, um, uh, is, is, the, is, is the market really thinking about inflation? Are they buying into that? Or is it just the standpoint of saying that, you know, look, as you said, fool me once, fool me twice, not going to get fooled again. Or whatever that famous uh, George W. Bush quote was there, um, but uh, is, is it is it really in the psychosis there, or is it the idea that we just can't generate inflation in this country? I think you know, a lot of that comes back to you know some of the problems that we've seen in terms of getting money circulating again, right? That velocity of money, which has been you know on, on a, a sharp downturn, especially on the back of the the sharp twenty five percent increase on the. I believe it was 25% increase on the M2 money growth over, yeah. over the year. You saw pretty much the, uh, the inverse of that with monetary velocity. So I think one of the challenges in any type of coming out of any type of recession and going into some form of recovery is the need for, for jobs to, to come back as well. You need to get people back to work. You need a sense of normalcy and you need that confidence perhaps uh, for consumers to go out there and spend again. And I think what underlies that isn't, you know, some of the things that we've seen on the fiscal policy front or even the, the monetary policy front, but you actually need people back in their seats again, back in the office perhaps, or, you know, uh, some type of home office and consuming again, having that confidence to be able to, to look forward to that. So, you know, perhaps, um, you know, yeah, but you, you picked on cons you talked about consumption there, right? And I think that's that's a critical thing that all, all of this fiscal spending last year was was deemed to be stimulus, and we've talked about it many times about it's not really stimulus uh, when you're replacing wages, right? And Correct. some instances the replacement rate was greater than people are making, and and you're always going to hear those anecdotes. But what we saw there was that 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 didn't lead to consumption, right? You, you had this transfer payments from the government didn't lead to consumption. It effectively led to savings or investing, right? 
and investing in, in assets, as you can see that a lot of people did last year to drive prices upward, um, isn't something that, that turns into money velocity, right? And so either people need to take, uh, take their gains and deploy it elsewhere, or there needs to be more of a consumption pattern. But uh, on, on that front too, uh, Mr. Mayberry, when we were talking about this in, in some of our macro meetings too, we were looking at differences between goods and service consumption, right? And what we saw there was that there was a heavy consumption in goods, not shockingly, uh, <clears throat> services in, in places like here, like in California, uh, where restaurants are still closed for consumption or you know, uh, for at least for dine-in at this point. Um, you're seeing less on the service side, but we really saw a big boost in goods, specifically durable goods. And so how do you think about that when thinking about inflation, um, seeing that increase, not just in consumption, but also in that side, the good side of the equation, driving prices higher right now? Well, I think that you, you saw that, as you said, that, that pickup in durable goods, but that's a, it, because they're durable, they're not going to, it's not repeatable. You're not going to be buying, you know, we always use the, the chest freezer as the example. You're not going to be buying multiple chest freezers. Um, you know, over time, you know, I have two, that's probably my limit of how many I need. Uh, but it's really something that you're not going to, it's not, it's not continuous. Um, and so I think that that, you know, you could see some slowdown from, from that side of, of inflation from that side of spending, uh, because it, it was so much in the, on the good side of thing versus services. Now, when, if we open back up the economy, you can, you'll, you'll see the services pop again. Um, and, and I did note yesterday that, uh, we 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 heard I heard the magic word again of infrastructure. So if there is in, if the stim, stimulus coming out of Congress isn't just hey here's money don't go to work don't do anything and, and instead is is productive assets is productive stimulus then I think that you you could get a little bit more inflation from that versus the the previous round of, of you know fiscal spending that that didn't really lead to inflation. Right. Well, I guess you're overweight the the chest freezers to having two. I'm I'm underweight. I have zero. Um, I think the optimal point for most is is one or fewer or one or less. So uh, we'll we'll have to see there. Um, so uh, Sam, when you were looking at the forecast across the street too, what are they talking about with uh, with interest rates in the U.S.? Yeah. So when we look at the the ten year Treasury as a as the proxy, there they came up with a average across it of just under 1.3%. So call it uh, 20, 25 basis points up from where we are. Okay. And so for this, um, you know, I, I guess the muted inflation, uh, people aren't saying it's going to drive really interest rates at this point, um, you know, call it 25 basis points higher or so. But a lot of the stuff we use in terms of thinking about valuation, whether that is money supply, and I'd argue for the velocity, uh, for inflation, you need the velocity, but the increase in the monetary base is significant. Uh, looking at things like the copper gold ratio that uh, you wrote a paper about a couple of years ago, Mr. Mayberry, as one of the barometers there, um, just looking at the kind of nominal GDP idea, um, even on a trailing basis, if you add in this kind of 4%, uh, kind of puts fair value on the 10 year treasury closer to the two handle. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked here to see that people think that this side is going to be well contained. So do you think that uh, the reason for that year-end forecast is, is more along the lines that the Fed is going to step in? Uh, you'd mentioned the phrase yield curve control earlier. Well, why do you think that there would be something, um, you know, a 10-year treasury that's, that's really 100, let's call it 125 basis points for kind of round numbers? Uh, versus something that, you know, on a lot of our fair value metrics augurs for something closer to a two-handle. I think that yeah. you, you, what you could see is the, the Fed stepping, or I guess market, markets are thinking that if we get too high of rates, then it starts to affect the equity markets and you could start to see the Fed step in, not, maybe not necessarily like explicit yield curve control, but pick up the, pick up the pace of their, their purchases. They've said uh, they're going to buy at least 80 billion uh, treasuries a month and 40 billion mortgages a month. Um, and the key words there are at least. So they're, they're, they're saying that we can buy more. And if, if it happens, if, if rates go up to a place where, where stock, the stock market as, as the kind of risk barometer starts to feel a little bit shaky, they'll pick up, they could pick up their purchases and that will keep rates at, you know, capped at a certain level. Um, I guess as long as rates kind of move up orderly, you don't really see uh, big, big effects on the stock market. I think that rates will kind of, kind of slowly grind higher until you do see some, some sort of uh, pickups. Yeah. So yeah, when I you think, talk um, about that, we talk about that. It's almost $1.5 trillion at least 
that they're committing to buy. But I, I've been positing this idea, and I think Sam, you want to say something there. But the, the idea that I've been positing is that what does increased asset purchases do? What does, at, at this level of interest rates, what does that really help? How does that help the consumer, let's say, um, if they decide that, hey, we're going to target the 10 year because we don't like it at these levels? And so, what do you think would be the advantage there, Sam, of the Fed actually stepping in? Um, I mean, corporate America refied last year. There was about 1.85 trillion in issuance in, in investment grade bonds. You bring the high yield and loan markets together. You had north of two two trillion dollars out there that was refied uh, in the marketplace. So, so what good does that do for the overall economy by doing yield curve control? Yeah. So, if we talk about yield curve, curve control and let's just stay on this kind of ten year as as the proxy, I think one of the inherent benefits that we've seen alongside the uh, the refi wave that we've seen within corporate America is how it impacts the consumer, as you're questioning. And a lot of that, uh, a good portion of the wealth, I think the home ownership rate uh, right now is back ticking up. It's somewhere around 67, 68%, if I recall correctly there. So having that direct benefit of yield curve control could impact, <clears throat> excuse me, could impact the uh, the mortgage rate, the cost of carry that, or the cost and uh, that, homeowners and mortgages would have to pay, making affordability uh, slightly more attractive, especially on the backdrop of the massive <laughs> increases in prices that we've seen in select areas of uh, the U.S. But overall in the U.S., you saw that increase in, in housing uh, demand and thus the increase in price. So you do have that, uh, that benefit to the consumer, I suppose. But it does seem like you know, the, the Fed is implementing some type of yield curve control, um, even if it's just in its own stepping up of and I would say it's necessary of buying of their purchases, you know, that 1.7 uh, trillion that you're saying that's coming out. If they continue down that path of, um, you know, uh, 80 billion a month in treasury purchases, I think they may even need to, to talk about increasing that given the potential fiscal spending needs that we see in 2021 and beyond. Yeah, you know, but the fiscal forget. spending needs that that has that that's not related to the consumer. That's just saying correct. who's going to buy the treasuries, right? But no, correct. At the but end that, of that it, comes back to uh, you know talking about having to to support that yield, right? Yeah. So increasing the, the 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 eventual purchases. Yeah, but if you think about yield curve control, they really have controlled the yield curve because because the Fed sets overnight lending rates, right? I mean that's really what they do on the front end of the curve, and then obviously QE is no longer an extraordinary policy; it's part of the toolkit. And even even Powell said that now he's admitted that QE and buying bonds uh, in the marketplace is just uh, you know status quo at this point, and it's part of their toolkit. But really, when you think about yield curve control, the way they've been able to do it to date is talking about the idea of not thinking about thinking about thinking about raising rates, right? And so the market, if you look at, uh, the market doesn't expect a rate hike for almost four years at this point. Now, again, things can change. If we get bigger growth, uh, obviously the past can change. But I think the Fed has controlled the yield curve. The front end has been massively pinned down. And prior to today, every single day in the rates market, the yield curve had steepened, right? The back end was going up and you know, the, the front end just was not really budging. And when I say the front end, I'm talking out to five years or so. I think the five years up like a basis point or so. So as you, th as you look at it, the Fed um, really has done a, a lot of work there um, in keeping the interest rates where they are. But um, do you think they're losing control of it? Is that what we've seen in the last few weeks? Is that, um, that they really need to step in? Do you think they're going to increase their purchases? I don't think so. I think they've actually... You started to hear a little bit of talk about them contemplating a taper of their purchases, you know, in, in 2022. So they, it seems like they're, they feel comfortable with the rate rise. They feel comfortable with the amount of purchases that they have, you know, on the table. But now they're trying to talk the market into, hey, we're not going to be buying 80 billion treasuries a month indefinitely. We're going to maybe start tapering. And, you know, they, they don't want a repeat of the uh, taper tantrum in 2013. Uh, so they're trying to prep the market for, hey, it's not going to go on forever. And so to me, that says that they're comfortable with this recent rate increase. They're comfortable with where rates are right now. And they're trying to say, even if rates go higher, we still may, as long as they go higher orderly, we may, we may start tapering our purchases you know, next year. But it could always be a perpetual next year. 
Right. Well, it's yeah. funny too, and you've you've heard the rhetoric about accepting inflation, and you know, there's a Fed governor out there saying that they're in it to win it. I know it's a phrase we've been we've been using around our virtual trading desk when we're having uh, conversations. But as as I look at it, you know, really the accommodation the Fed the Fed did a lot last year, and so you know, we, we were having a conversation at the roundtable prime, and and I asked uh, Mr. Gunlock, I said, you know. Does the Fed even really matter at this point, right? They, they've given you support. They've given you, they're truly on autopilot at this point, I feel like. They're not going to raise rates. Uh, they're going to continue their purchases. And so I was asking him, is it even relevant? You know, and he said, they're extremely relevant because it's the other side. They can screw it up, right? <laughs> and so I think what you what you see here is this, this difference of opinions and some of the local Fed governors coming out. You're starting to see, not that they're screwing it up, but you're seeing this kind of public discussion of differing views. And so, um, you know, do you think that we will actually taper in, uh, the Fed will actually taper their purchases in 2021? I think it all depends. I mean, I would say the the biggest risk right now along, and I agree with that statement, you know, is, is one is the Fed misstep, you know, either in what their forward guidance uh, uh, provides or if they, you know, rate and start to, to hike rates a little bit too early or perceived to be tapering a little bit too early as well, because a lot of that is still contingent on where we progress as an economy, which itself is contingent upon how uh, the path of COVID goes forward, especially as we're seeing the, the slow rollouts on what was optimism around the, the vaccinations. Uh, something like, I think, 3% of the U.S. is now has received its vaccinations, which is well short of, you know, of course, projected goals. So, We'll see how that continues, but I think those are the two primary um, risks to, to markets and the economy right now, um, more so with right. the Fed for the markets, the economy uh, linked in through the vaccinations and COVID. Yeah, I want to throw in another risk out there, too. Let's talk about the labor market. We've seen a, a you know, a huge drop in, in, in employment last year, obviously, with the shutdowns and, and targeted parts that we, we call now the COVID-related sectors of the economy. Um, we've seen an improvement there. There'd been this nice path of improvement. The U3 unemployment rate was declining pretty precipitously. Uh, it spiked to, to really uh, levels we haven't seen since the Great Depression. Uh, we always continue to monitor the continuing claims when it's unemployment claims out there. And we see the U3 rate, you know, it's about 6.7% after the last uh, jobs report uh, from last week. Uh, that we saw. However, uh, I saw the JOLTS data, you know, it's kind of disappointing that there wasn't a lot more job openings coming back. And you usually see this in, in, in some form of uh, contraction where the labor market, it's quick to lose jobs. Uh, it takes a long time to grind back. But you're talking about the COVID uh, related, the vaccinations, the optimism around that. But really, when I look at continuing claims, I still see you know, the magnitude of almost 20 million people receiving some form of government assistance, whether that's the traditional channel or through these extraordinary programs or the, um, the emergency programs that we've called them, the PUA and the PEUC programs. So what, what are you thinking about when it looks at the labor market component? And I'll let you take this one, Jeff. Like when you look at the labor market and the improvement there, uh, we're starting to hit some stagnation. What do you think the kind of risks to the economy are uh, when it comes to that side of the labor equation? I, mean, I think you you definitely have you know, six point seven percent unemployment. Two years ago, you have been like that. That's a horrible, you know, it's a horrible horrible rate of unemployment. Today, it's like, well, at least it's not twenty. Um, <laughs> so you know, at least it, it's it's improving or it was improving. I think you know, as as you know, as we kind of work things out, whether it's uh, when when the vaccinations, when the economy has to really open up. So many you said so many of those um, job losses are in the services, leisure, and hospitality that. You really need not not only the vaccine to come through, but you need people to feel comfortable going out again. So even if people are vaccinated and and dep depends on infection rates and whether those numbers continue to climb, presumably when people get the more people that get vaccinated, those numbers will come down. But it seems like it's going to take a lot more time than people were initially projecting to to get everything back open. So I think that you know that 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 is a, is a real sore point is, is that labor market and you know. That, that unemployment rate going to stay, I think it will stay kind of at these more elevated levels for, you know, at least a few more months until things start to, to calm down a little bit. Yeah. And well, on that, on that front too, as you think about, 
um, kind of the labor market and its impact on everything. Let's let's talk about small businesses too, right? I mean, that, that's the thing that's been disproportionately hit here as well. And uh, there's a lot of uh, adages out there that, uh, for instance, the small business is the backbone of the U.S. economy. And so I think some of the things that haven't been uh, in in the calculus here are, you know, the the permanent closures, and we've seen this kind of through. Uh, what I've called the alternative data set, things like Yelp closures or delisting of, of, of uh, businesses on, on that is permanently closed. Um, how, how do you think we can get that part of the economy going again? Because it's one thing to talk about corporate America, it's to talk about the Googles and Amazons and everybody. And obviously, you know, they have low cost of, of, of capital financing to the debt markets. And, you know, they're, they're, they can survive the downturns. But what about these parts of the economy, which are really America, right? Um, how, how do we how do we get that back going? I mean, I think I mean let's just use California as an example here. It's what we're here on this call most familiar with. But you know, when we look at the small businesses that surround us where we live in in suburban America, let's say you look at the the restaurants, the bars, um, you know, maybe even dry cleaning, something like that, you know, the convenience stores that you use on a daily basis. And from there, you see, because of the um, the, the shelter in place and the or emergency orders coming out of uh, the state, you have the those in the food and beverage industries having to, to shut down involuntarily. So obviously with that, you need those to be lifted before people can go back um, and start uh, you know, engaging in business in the, in the restaurant industry again around there. So that's kind of what it takes for the suburban side. But the, the area that I worry about is around the urban center. So let's say around downtown LA, the times that we've been in the office, you see, you know, restaurants there that we, you know, frequented before and they're, they're largely shuttered. They're closed, even without the, you know, the, the state mandated, mandated closures of, of restaurants, you know, a lot of them had shuttered. And instead what we saw were, were food trucks, you know, which is you know, a, a great way to, to, you know, to kind of circumvent the, the, the closures on the, the restaurants. But one of the fears is as, you know, people start to eventually emerge and go back to the offices, they're probably going to do so at a reduced capacity. And you have to wonder what happens to these satellite businesses that are dependent on the foot traffic of those office workers coming back. Even if they do find a way to return, you know, the, the, the previously shuttered businesses have a way of returning back to business. Um, or even if you have, a, you have to have a new tenant in place, it's, it's going to be at reduced capacity. So, you know, I think those business owners are going to have to re, you know, rethink about, uh, about business prospects going forward and how they're going to conduct that business with reduced foot traffic around their areas as, you know, all indications are that uh, the return to normalcy is going to be at reduced capacity when it comes to, to going back to the office and working and sitting next to, to your coworkers again. Yeah, yeah, I think the plexiglass we have on the trading desk doesn't provide that huge sense of comfort there uh, <laughs> without without some uh, incremental protection. But so we're talking about the the overall economy. You know, that's why I, I, all of this is you know that four point three percent real uh, kind of on average we see. I, I think it's really a lot of that. If we're going to get to those levels, is predicated upon you know this uh, this recovery here of these small businesses as well. So I was like to say, you know, if if you really care about it. You know, or order from one of your local restaurants and stuff, try to keep them going. That's something we, we try to do, at least in my household, a couple times a week, just to make sure we're, we're trying to at least help out the, the places that are, that are local to us. Um, so let's talk about valuation at this point. So we talked about the rates market. It seems, seems rates are a little overvalued, uh, probably should drift higher. Um, equity market. Right, so uh, we've got the CAPE ratio on the U.S. equity market exceeding 30 once again. I think it was 33 roughly in the last print. Uh, look at trailing PE. Uh, obviously, in a in a decimated year, that gets challenging, but still has a 30 handle on it. Um, we saw Wall Street get clever last year instead of using a forward 12 month PE, they decided <laughs> to use two years earnings, which uh, you both snicker. Uh, they're not very good at forecasting the one year, let alone um, you know. It, bootstrapping that into two years into the future. And uh, it tends to get ratcheted down over time anyway. That number still on the two-year basis is in the mid-20s at this point. Um, so thinking about the equity market, um, is it just this mega cap effect? It's dominated by the six uh, largest stocks in there, the, the, the things that are popular with the day traders. Um, what are you thinking about in the equity market, Jeff, as you, as you look across the spectrum of valuation and, and, what, uh, and where we are at these levels today? 
I mean, I think if you look at the S&P 500, it, it had been dominated by those, those six mega caps. Um, th those have kind of come back a little bit back to earth, I guess, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, they're not as, as dominant as they were before in terms of driving performance. But when you think about it, as you said earlier, even the smallest company in the S&P 500 is still a, a very large company. It's still, it's still a large cap. And so they still have cheap financing. They can, they can still borrow at low rates. So I think you could, you could see that, that, that borrowing, those, those rates uh, continue to drive performance of the S&P 500. Uh, you know, a, a CAPE ratio of, of 34 uh, is actually not that much different from where it was at the beginning of last year of 31. I mean, um, so it's not extremely overvalued. You could argue uh, it's 10% still... higher, actually, you know, but I mean... again, I'm not going to argue with you. Okay. <laughs> but if you, if you, if we, you, we were going into last year, we said the CAPE ratio is 31, you know, you wouldn't expect an 18% return from the S&P 500, right? So you, I'm not saying we're going to get another 18%. We're not going to, maybe we're not going to go up another 10% in, in the CAPE ratio, but it's not out, out of the realm. So on that bag, on that backdrop, so do you expect, Expect to see a change in leadership in 2021. Um, you know, the stock market was dominated by the kind of work from home or the uh, work from home environment type of names. Um, in most cases, these were very uh, technologically centered companies. Um, and if you think about what you've seen since the announcement of the vaccine, which happened to correspond uh, right after the, um, the uh, announcement of the election, because uh, the election took about a week to figure out what the actual result was. Um, you saw that there was this huge rotation. And so um, was it value? Was it just kind of the stuff that had been beaten down a lot? A lot of it was the COVID related sectors. And so um, is this the making of a trend where it's going to be a more diverse uh, type of earnings a season in 2021? Or do you expect to see the same leadership? Are there certain things that you're thinking about when it comes to the various sectors of the U.S. market? Yeah, so I mean, I'll pick up on that one there. I think, you know, you, let's not forget, too, you know, we're, we've been calling it the big six, but now you pretty much have to call it the big seven, right, with the inclusion of uh, with Elon here. We'll see if uh, it, what, what that drives. But overall, I mean, I think the argument has appeal, what you're talking about in the rotation. I'm not sure if I completely buy into it, especially, you know, beyond just a, a short term period. I think you know, the, the cohort of tech, let's just say, as, as an uh, overall sector, still, I, I think, has, you know, some room to, to outperform. Although I would argue that, you know, perhaps, you know, given the rotation trade and, you know, the, the value coming perhaps in favor for the short term, you're going to see that outperformance um, narrow a little bit. But I still think there's room to run there. Um, yeah. you well, know, they overall, say that growth, when, when growth is scarce, growth at a premium, right? And that's, that's yeah. been really challenge here um, and interest rates have to do with that especially if you, you don't get a lot of earning power off of it so the scarcity of growth has been there but if we're talking about vaccinations if we're talking about pent-up demand uh, it does seem to me that other pockets could participate as well and you you mentioned elon uh, it's pretty amazing too with the stock price today um, that you, you only pay i think it's uh you know if you if you buy the stock today on the market cap it's worth like a million five for every car that they sell. So one point five million right. dollars per car uh, is the valuation there. So not sure if um, if that's a right metric to use or not, but I just find that that an interesting tidbit. So as yeah. you look across the spectrum, though, too, you know, we've been focusing on looking at the the multiples across the globe too. And you know, when you even seen some of the rise you saw in emerging markets last year. Uh, emerging markets just set a new all-time high. Uh, most people think, oh, yeah, of course, you know, the emerging markets, um, you know, do a, do a new high. Uh, but when you go back and look at it, that high was, uh, previous high was back in 2007, right before the global financial crisis. So it's finally started to recover there. Um, what, what kind of pockets of opportunity are you seeing outside the globe? Is it EM? Uh, is it in the Eurozone? Are you thinking about Asian equities? Um, what are you guys thinking about? Well, I think if you look at your CAPE ratio for those other other sectors or, or a PE ratio for those other sectors outside the U.S., they're certainly at cheaper levels um, and that it makes sense to, uh, this would be a good time to diversify your holdings. Everyone always talks about how, or, or everyone in the U.S. Or, and or there's a, that home country bias, and maybe now is a good time to diversify into those, into those Asian equities. Uh, if you want to take on some risk, to buy those EM equities. 
Um, and, and Europe well, had a good year last year in terms of the equity market, uh, but continue to, to be a, um, it could be a good driver going forward, just given the, the lower PE ratio, PE ratios over there. Um, so this is maybe a good time to kind of diversify that. You that talked rate. about Europe having a good year. A lot of that is if you're a dollar investor too, yeah. right? So the currency yes. drove yeah. a lot of that return. Um, speaking of currency, Sam, what's the outlook uh, that you have for currencies um, across the globe? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, conversation begins with just having a view on the dollar, you know, and then the impact that, you know, FX, um, you know, pairs will have on the dollar. And I think overall, we're just, the, the medium term outlook is that the dollar is going to be weaker from here. You know, it's the, the backdrop that we, we touched on a little bit earlier with just the amount of fiscal spending that we've embarked upon as a country with about 15 or 16 percent of uh of uh, GDP being spent in deficit. And that was around $3 trillion last year uh, in deficit spending. But you look at the overall rise in debt, that was about $4 trillion there. So one of the things that we've looked at over time is that you know, the, as trade deficits increase, as well as if you tack on their, um, I'm sorry, if uh, fiscal deficits increase uh, on top of the trade deficits, which has also been uh, in decline, uh, concurrently with the, the trade deficit, as those both uh, tick up in terms of the deficit, the, the dollar moves uh, in an inverse way. So the dollar typically trails a little bit, but for all intents and purposes, given the direction of the, the twin deficits, if you will, it seems like the dollar um, in terms of the currency should be moving lower from that perspective, which makes me think that you know certain parts of the um, especially let's say if the, the emerging market countries there could have a, a benefit on the tailwind from there. But on a near term basis, it's hard to say, you know, the next direction that the dollar could um, be up from here for all we know, given that you know, we have seen a significant uh, move down in the dollar, where if you look at the Dixie, it's right around the, that 90 level, which is a, a level of support that's been bouncing around. It's, you know, it, it went down a little bit below 90, but it seems to have been, you know, finding uh, some type of consolidation right there at 90. But uh, in terms the of- low, I think it's been 88 or so, and it's been 88 handle. I think if you go back on the charts, 88 is the low. If you break through, you know, the technicals yeah. tell you it's, it's safely lower. But, um, you know, look, I, I personally, you know, did some rebalancing after the stock market this year. I, I, I decided that, you know, it was time to rebalance more towards some of these areas, put some new money to work and kind of the Euros, the EM, AM as well. But- and a lot of that's predicated on that view on the dollar. But um, one thing that we haven't talked about that tends to be highly correlated to the dollar are commodity prices. And so, um, you know, given you guys focus in the commodity markets as well, um, you know, there's been some very, very strong performance. A lot of people just focus on WTI. We talked about it being down 60%. That's not on a spot price. That's actually if you invest in, you know, the nature of, of investing across the, um, the, the curve and the way you have to invest in that. But we've seen a huge run up um, towards the end of the year in precious metals. Well, precious metals all year. Um, we also saw it in industrial metals have rebounded significantly. Um, is there room to run there? Um, is that a lot of that priced in? Is this really predicated on a lower dollar? Uh, how are you thinking about commodities and allocating to that sector of the, of the market? I mean, I think yeah, it, I think that, it's, oh, it's, uh, go oh, ahead. Sir. Yeah, uh, so sorry about that, Mayberry. But uh, similar equities, you have seen that strong price uh, movement in the, the last three quarters of 2020. But I think the one difference is, is something that Mayberry touched on as well is the fundamentals in commodities seem to be more attractive than the high valuations that we're seeing across the equity markets. I mean, I think in, in the U.S. in particular, you're seeing across all measures of valuation, as, you know, the S&P 500 looks expensive, but that's not to say that there's not more room to run uh, in the near term, but with commodities, you're seeing it a little bit different. I think the fundamental backdrop there is, is a little bit more attractive based both on supply and as well as growth needs. Um, the exception, as you mentioned, might be energy because uh, the supply there has been artificially constrained given um, OPEC plus and their voluntary curbing of production, you know, led by Saudi Arabia of the recent 1 million barrels per day cut there. Uh, but I think that backdrop fundamentally looks somewhat attractive, especially when we think about areas like industrial metals, which could participate in some of the themes that we've been talking about, you know, a rebounding growth, um, a move towards uh, infrastructure spending. And it seems like uh, across the 
the world, there is some type of uh, the, the Paris Agreement, the adoption towards uh, the idea that we need to move towards cleaner energy. And with that, that's going to require and facilitate some of that infrastructure spending of which I think industrial metals can uh, participate in. Uh, from the traditional sense, but then also, I mean, if you think about it from industrial metals and their usage in, in electric vehicles, that also augurs for a, a uh, pickup in a positive backdrop for the industrial metals sector. So I think with commodities, yeah, it's not going to be, you know, not all commodities are going to behave, you know, similarly across the cohort, but on average, I think they're, if you're just looking at a basket way of investing in commodities, it should be a positive backdrop as well. Um, energy might get a little boost uh, going be, you know, in the later part of 2021, 2022, again, as economies start to you know, hopefully get back uh, on track in terms of, of uh, normalcy again. So, and of course, we've also seen the pickup in, in agriculture uh, as well. A lot of that, I think, is also a supply-based issue. Um, there seems to be tightness in inventory balances across um, the major countries that uh, focus on in those areas, the U.S. included, but um, you know, just hearing about uh, the weather patterns in South America lately with uh, La Nina, you know, something that we're, we're uh, seeing in terms of uh, the drought, something that we've seen here as well in the U.S. So well, I think, it'll I, be, I think it'll, overall positive commodities. I think it'll be interesting, uh, you know, Sam, one of the things you put together in that, in that uh, Wall, Street, Wall Street list is that the, the highest oil price that we saw for WTI, the highest estimate was $53 a barrel. And that's where we're at today. We're there. Right. So, so we're already there. We've already made our 10%. Or, you know, the oil market's already made us 10%. Yeah, I think that you, know, you, could see, you could see oil go up a lot from here, just given the fact that you have low demand, the economy is pretty shut down. Uh, there's no, the airline, you know, you saw the TSA traveler data, I know I brought it up earlier, but you could, if you see that pickup in, in travel, travelers, you see more aircraft flying. That's obviously a big, big chunk of, of oil and energy demand that you really, it's not replaceable with, you know, electric cars. And so that, yeah, okay. you can see that. So one thing neither of you touched on was the precious metals though. So what do you think about the precious metals? Uh, very strong year. We talked about uh, gold being up north of 20% or so. Uh, how do you think about the precious metal space? I think that, you know, it's good to have, you want, always want that kind of ballast precious metals, whether it's, you know, I, I think you think about gold as, as a, as a permanent, uh, you know, form, form of, of against you know deflation against you know I think it's it, it become it should become a bigger part of people's portfolios I think that it's it's a good ballast point to have in your portfolio versus uh, to, to to kind of offset some of the risk that is in in the other other you know in the stock market in uh, the other commodities it's a good it's a good position to hold even even at these levels at 1900 on in gold is it a little bit uh, or 1850 is it a little bit Higher than maybe maybe it's not a great trade location, but it's something to keep an eye on it as we get kind of as it kind of moves around. Maybe try to try to add to your gold positions from uh, from here, just as a as a kind of a as as a hedge. All right. So on the the hedge, the the, the rage of the town, and uh, for those that are worried about the fiat, was cryptos last year. Uh, how are you thinking about crypto, and um, what's your uh, what's your thoughts on it? Well. I finally dipped my toes in, but that's because I was offered a uh, free $10 to put towards crypto. But it's just been interesting. I can tell you just in the short time that I've been, uh, let's say, invested in crypto, I've, you know, it's definitely, you know, I understand the speculative nature of it in terms of the swings. You know, I, you know, every now and again, you'll look at the intraday moves and say, wow, it's down 5%. Next five, you know, next a uh, couple minutes later, it's up ten percent. But one one of the things I've also noticed as well is that you can trade in and out of it twenty four hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week. So it definitely racks your mind. That's not something as an investor that I, I think I would go in big, uh, outside of a speculative reason. Um, I still don't really see the store of value, but I think there's you know significant upside, you know, even from here, with uh, certain cryptos based, and I'm basing that largely on the fact that, you know, one of the things that you need in any type of market is institutional acceptance. And it seems like certain um, uh, management firms are moving towards that. Certain types of uh, corporations are moving that towards it, per perhaps, you know, with uh, their, their corporate balance, uh, their, their treasury uh, needs as well. So as you start to see an increase in a limited supply um, vehicle like Bitcoin, for example, 
then perhaps that institutional acceptance and the fund creations around that will naturally push prices up from where they're at. But in terms of a store of value, I'm not, I don't know enough about it. I'm still you know, very naive around it, but it doesn't seem to have that store of value um, that gold has if we're talking about the uh, uh, comparison there. But from a speculative front, uh, if you're a trader, you know, definitely it just seems like an exciting place to, <laughs> exciting is a good word there, but exciting place to, to be for, for that type of investment. Yeah. Well, the problem I think with it is too, is how do you value it? Um, you know, people have tried to put together models, but uh, always with something that, that swings around, you can always use technicals and things to do that. So, um, well, look, I, I think we, we've covered a lot here. Um, you know, before we go, we got to go to your favorite part of the show, but also um, why don't you guys announce what you guys plan on doing starting February of this year? Um, I think you guys are spinning out and uh, branch out on your own. Yeah, I, I don't. I wouldn't say a spin out because uh, uh, Sam's still going to be uh, the co-host of the Sherman Show. But if you liked kind of what we talked about here today, uh, Sam and I are going to be launching a uh, the Double Line Monday Minutes uh, podcast where we'll be uh, talking about macro and and uh, economy and markets. Uh, very 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 short though. You know, 15, 20 minutes. Give a recap of the past week. Recap of what we think is going to happen in, in the upcoming week. Um, and then, you know, just something to get people get their week started on, uh, on, on what's going on and what we think could happen. Okay. All right. Well, everybody tune in for that uh, Monday minutes uh, with, May with Jeff Mayberry and Sam Lau. So it's going to be another Jeff and Sam um, and um, look forward to uh, seeing what you guys are cranking out. But before we uh, hop to that, uh, we have a special guest today, Mark Kimbrough, who works on the multi-asset team here or the macro asset allocation team. Uh, it's coming in to do the Sherman Says because we couldn't let Sam cheat and see what topic's going to be. So, Mark, why don't you kick us off? All right. Well, uh, let's get the order of Mr. Sherman, Mr. Loud, and Mr. Mayberry. And let's start it off. Uh, number one, Mr. Sherman, commodities. Bye. Uh, social media. Dangerous. Uh, Georgia Senate runoff. Thankfully behind us. Retail investors in 2021. Strong. U.S. dollar. Down. Cryptocurrencies. Um, tradable. Value stocks. Resurging. Trade deficit. Surging. NFL playoffs. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. I, no. I, I heard deficit. I thought budget deficit. <laughs> uh, um, trade deficit. Trade deficit not going away. Uh, NFL playoffs. I, I have extra time to think about this one. Yeah. Um, well, we got uh, the Ram, the Rams, you know, home, home of Los Angeles Rams uh, versus <laughs> Laos Green Bay Packers uh, coming up this weekend. So. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It, uh, it's hard to bet against Aaron Rodgers, though. I'm taking Hector out, man. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to green energy for Mr. Sherman. Future. U.S. manufacturing. Um, may come back and then he owes me money. Second year of work from home. Uh, we're, we're planning on a second year of working from home. I'm calling this the second year right now. This is okay. okay. So 2020 just, or, or, or 2020 lasted so long that it just feels like we're in this, the second year. Yeah. Um, more limited. Last round here. Pent up demand. Questionable. Uh, taper tantrum. Hope not. Same here. And last, tax rates. Going higher, certainly. All right. And that's all I got. All Thank right. Well, uh, I think that's one thing is uh, death and taxes, right? We'll never short those two things. So, all right. Well, thanks, Mayor, for joining. Again, thanks, everyone, for listening. This is our markets recap. Um, you know, we'll, we'll come back in a couple of weeks with some new guests. Uh, we've got a pretty good lineup for the season. So we're pretty pleased to see uh, what that brings. Um, as always, you can follow us on the Sherman Show 
pod on the Twitter. It's at Sherman Show Pod. Uh, you can get these on youtube.com backslash double line capital if you want to see our, uh, our friendly faces here. And most importantly, tune in for uh, also the, the Monday Minutes, which is kicking off in a couple of, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, we post that on all of our various social media accounts and the likes uh, so you can see those as well. But tune in. Uh, we got a good lineup of guests. Uh, good luck to everyone in 2020. Stay safe, stay healthy, and support your local businesses.